Don't let everybody be first. I mean, Troy, you were going to be here either way, right? If, uh, if you were in Washington or Nebraska. Different pin. <laughs> different pin. But yeah, I, I would have been here be, either way. What's it like just to, to, to finally come to one of these meetings? You know a lot of the people here already. Um, how much fun has it been? You no, know, I, I, I know most of the people that have been in this building a lot of times. Uh, but it's, it's neat to be here in this capacity. Uh, and I, I, I actually love to hear Matt speak. You know, he gets, he gets me fired up. He gets me excited. And I'm already pretty excited. I, I don't think I've ever... This is, I think, football season 18 for me. Mm-hmm. Never looked forward to one as much as I'm looking forward to this one. But this is what really gets it started. What's the thing that you look forward to most? Why, why do you say that? I want to see what that stadium is like. I, you know, I, I've been in it. I've never been in it for a game. You know, this, this, is, this is one of the bastions, the cornerstones of college football in Lincoln, Nebraska. And to be a part of it and, and be able to have some ownership in it, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited. I want to see what it's like. I want to feel that energy inside the stadium. That, Matt's been talking to me about since I got here. You know, I know it might not be the way you envisioned in January, but to be here and to see that W on the board, um, you know, is there a level of satisfaction that you can take from being here and, and seeing that job completed? You know, uh, when, when I got there, I think uh, it had been about 45 days since the announcement. Mm-hmm. And, and so uh, the four schools were involved in all the meetings along the way over the course of the last year. And, and I think the Big Ten did a great job of involving and including and you, while you weren't voting on anything, you know your your say was was being heard. So there's been a great job by the league of integrating all four schools. Uh, it, it'll be exciting. Uh, you know, I, I know what the, the the buzz was on campus. The athletes at Washington were looking forward. You know, this is a whole different set of venues, a whole different set of experiences, and everybody was really looking forward to this this opportunity. And Matt just said it's it's a great league. And, and it's, it is the NFL. It spreads from one end of the country to the other end of the country, and there's going to be a lot of very different experiences for people. Uh, a lot of our kids get to go to California and play in Southern California. It's a different world, something maybe we've never experienced. What fires you up about hearing him talk when, when you listen to those 15 minutes? Well, I, I've, I've said this. I think Matt's as good at the podium as, as anyone you'll see. Because he has a broader, he's not just a football coach. You know, he's, he's a mentor to a lot of the other coaches um, on our staff. He's involved and, and has an understanding of how everything that happens in the football program affects every other sport. He's got good relationships with our other coaches. So when you, you know, sit there and listen to him talk about the academic and the education, it's not he's not uh, talking about it because he's at the podium. He believes it. And it's a reason inside the department everybody rallies around a coach who's a leader like that when his interests are the interests of everyone in the department. Hey, Troy, lots of talk about roster sizes in the future. And obviously it's a bigger deal in Nebraska than most places. Yeah. Where, where are you at on that? What do you know and, and what, are your hoping, what are your hopes for future roster sizes? Well, you know, the Big Ten in general has wanted larger roster sizes. You know, we've, the, it, well, Nebraska in particular, but a lot of the Big Ten schools have really built themselves on, on walk-on programs over the years. However, and I said this to Mitch a, a week ago, I'm not, I have not gotten too worked up. Matt's not gotten too worked up because the year before COVID, roster sizes by the NCAA were, were regulated at 110. And that's how many could come into camp was 110. And so we grew to 105 or 115 and 120 for two reasons. One, COVID, to have more kids with COVID going through. And then secondly, with the sixth year kids, the extra COVID kids. So we were still able to recruit high school kids at the same numbers. So we're used to roster numbers that are a little smaller. Even while we have a 140 going through summer workouts, the current rule is 120. So we're always going to have to make cuts when camp starts. It's just a matter of where do those where do those numbers end? And I've said this: uh, the details, the the number is inconsequential as much as the details of how that number is derived, and does that number last throughout the year? Can we still have our 140? Can we still build that program and then come into camp with with you know basically a cut? And and you know we've all gone through cuts, uh, but can we still do that? Those are the questions I don't know the answers to. Just Troy, talking to Rich Clark earlier about. Campuses preparing for potential of hosting uh, CFP games. And they've sent surveys out, did a lot of. What's been like maybe the some of the bigger challenges that let's say Nebraska would face should should that come to be in December that you guys gotta have to work through? Well, I think Northern Latitude schools are all gonna have to worry about weather in, in a way that we don't normally have to. However, we're already playing a home game every other year, right? Thanksgiving weekend, so it's only a couple of weeks different. Uh, but preparing for what a mid-December looks like. Uh, you know, we, we've talked about whether we're going to put grass in our field, keep turf in our field. 
you know, if, if you're going to have grass in your field, you need live grass if you're going to be playing in December. So there are other considerations that need to be made. But, you know, the idea of could we host a playoff game uh, at our place, I think would be off the charts for people. Obviously something that's unprecedented. So whatever challenges there, the excitement and the adrenaline we'd go through if you were in that position are gonna more than offset any of those challenges. Any requirements of winterization or anything like that that's been discussed from the CFP? No, no, nothing that I've seen uh, come down yet. But you know, there's, there's more information now. At this point in time, nobody can winterize their field if they haven't already winterized it. But, but making sure, if, as I said, if, if we have high school playoff games in there and you know, Thanksgiving weekend and it's a rainstorm and the field gets torn up, trust me, we will have pallets of, of whatever we need to have. Again, assuming we had a grass field, we'd have pallets of grass ready to go. So we'll make whatever accommodations, we'll have everything on standby because we want our athletes to have the best chance for success. And we want our fans to have the best possible environment to enjoy the playoff game. Get to that point. So if you go to grass, are you anticipating you could still host high school football championships oh, sure. still? Sure. You know, this is not the grass of 25 years ago. Uh, th this this is grass. Those, uh, a, lot of, a lot of stadiums host high school championships in grass. Uh, there are contingencies that you have to make. And, and we'll have a good, long, large crew that would take good care of that grass. But it wouldn't change what we do in the stadium now. What would the timeline of that be? Uh, at the earliest, 26, but I'm not guaranteeing to be 26. Uh, there's other stadium work that we're planning to do, and, and it would be a part of that stadium work. So really, how the stadium work would align with, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to put grass in and have to go drive tr trucks over it and tear the grass up in a year. So uh, getting that system, uh, it's going to be at least a couple of years, but again, contingent on how we handle the stadium renovations going forward. But grass will happen. That's the plan for grass to happen. Yeah, yeah. Matt's highly motivated for grass. Okay. Uh, we've done some work on the practice fields. We've retopped them with new grass. Uh, after this season, we plan to dig those out, uh, put subsurface heating in to keep those practice fields grass alive. Uh, he'll practice on grass uh, unless there's lightning or it's impossible. We won't go indoors if, if uh, that's his preference to play on grass. And I think that's maybe a little bit of the NFL coaching. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of. There's a lot of uh, safety evidence, uh, uh, an injury history that shows you want to play on grass, you can possibly play on grass. But it's not like it was 20 years ago right. with, with the, the grass getting torn up. And, and even now, Bermuda grasses are grown at our latitude. Uh, whereas, you know, it was it was maybe rye grass and, and bluegrass uh, years and years ago. So it's evolved, and, and I think we're ready to evolve with it. Well, You've versed been, in this subject. Uh, I've done a lot of research. <laughs> uh, You've been pretty candid about um, just the relationship between winning and support for, you know, stadium renovations, winning and support for NIL, things like that. What, what, what does a good season this year look like? Uh -huh. uh, you know, if you, if you go into any game and you don't expect to have a chance to win, you know, and, and that's all you hope for. One of the things I've told every coach and I've told every athlete as I've met with, you know, all the best we can do, and I use a track analogy, and if we're in lane four, we're gonna run as fast as we can in lane four, we're gonna be prepared in lane four, and, and at the end of the race, lane three may be us. We can't control necessarily what happens in lane three, but if we do everything right in lane four, that is the best we can do. And so, you know, it is sports. Weird things happen in lane three, and sometimes you don't perform in lane four the way you want to. But the one thing I do have confidence in in our coaches and our staff, and this is across the board, not just football, we have a, we're really well prepared to make sure we do and optimize ourselves in lane four as best we can. Is there, um, you know, how, how many things you've been able to knock off maybe Matt Rule's to-do list when you got here? Well, I joke, and I, I'll, he gave me a list the night that I came to campus. Uh, I landed about 10 p.m. At 11 o'clock, he was taking me through the Golden Big facility at the time, now the Osborne Legacy Complex. And he handed me a folder of 17 things. These are the 17 things I think we need to do to win here. And and uh, someday, you know, well, someday that'll be a list of 27, right? Someday sure. it'll be a list of 35. But someday I'll, I'll, I'll bring that list out because it's in a folder. It's, it's uh, locked in the bottom of my desk, but he's right. He's been right on I, I, almost every one of them. He may be right on every one of them. So, you know, he, he's the expert. He's built programs in places that are harder to build than, than at Nebraska. So leaning on him, you know, my job is to facilitate his needs. Uh, one of the things as, as a staff, we told all the coaches, staff doesn't work, the coaches don't work for us. We work for them. 
and our job is to empower their success. And so uh, Matt's done a really good job for me of defining what needs to happen in order for success to come his way. Is there um, anything on that list that another school in the Big Ten already has? Like that you're trying to catch up to? Well, we're trying to catch up to anybody that wins more than we do. You know, and, and there are a lot of ways to do that. Some of them within our control, some of them not within our control. And it's not just things. It's not just baubles and trinkets and toys. It's philosophies. It's, it's ease of approach. How can we make things easier so we don't worry about this? And let's worry about this, which really impacts winning. And I think that's the other central piece to his list and, and really where it would have jived with my list coming in. If it doesn't matter to whether we win or lose, let's not waste our time worrying about it. Hey, Troy, the new arrangement with your NIL, I mean, how, what kind of impact have you seen with that, um, with donors now being able to get the uh, priority points or the, the potential uh, charity tax write-off donations? Oh, uh, overwhelmingly positive response. You know, part of it's just re-educating our people about why this is the investment. Sometimes we need them to invest in tickets. Sometimes we need them to invest in the annual fund. Sometimes we need them to invest in a capital improvement. Right now, the priority in order to, how do we win? We have to invest in talent. And it's NIL today. Next year, it'll be the revenue share model. And so getting people used to the fact that, that supporting the program in a way that directly benefits financially the student athletes may have been verboten 10 years ago, and it may not have been something they ever contemplated 20 years ago as they grew up with it, but it's really vitally important today because this is the model for college athletics and college football in particular. The SEC put out the number 15 million of the 22 million would go potentially towards football. Um, I mean, what are the Big Ten athletic directors' thoughts on that? I mean, that's a fairly large number of the 22. And well, I don't, think, I don't think anybody wants anybody to spend more than anybody else does. We all want to have that level of a playing field. I remember, if, if you go back to when cost of attendance came in, remember if, if we would say if somebody was getting 3,500 in cost of attendance, we were getting 2,500. There's no way a kid will ever come to our school because of that $1,000 dollar don't. They don't even talk about cost of attendance anymore. But, you know, we all want to be on as level of a playing field as possible, including financially, including how we support our programs. That said, the playing field is never level. And, and whether it's facilities, whether it's weather, whether it's history, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's access to talent, there are inequities every place along the way. Where we've gotten ourselves in trouble is trying to legislate everything equitably. And it's just not. However, as we get into this new world, if you will, doing things like this commonly uh, uh, to where you're not trying to buy, somebody can't necessarily buy success, that you're all similarly situated. Uh, it is a priority, I think, for, for all of us. Since you last talked about the stadium, how have you felt about how you've been able to recalibrate with the plans, and what are like the key items just ahead of the stadium? Well, a lot of it's just been settling, getting a staff built, uh, getting somebody, I, I, I just hired somebody that I, I had hired at Tulane to come in and, and oversee facilities and capital planning. I've got a meeting scheduled with the architects again here just to kind of recalibrate where we at with east and west designs. Let's start with what, what are the price tags. So, you know, I, I don't think there's nothing imminent, and, and I don't think you'll see anything imminent, at least through the season, as far as this is going to happen with the state or that's going to happen. There are things we have to get done and improvements we make. We've invested about $6 million in Wi-Fi uh, uh, so we can do point-of-sale systems, so we can... So eventually we can go to ticketless uh, access, you know, which is the standard, right, Any, anywhere else. So we're starting to do a lot of things like that. But the actual physical, when's this coming down? When are we making those improvements? We really haven't done much more than we talked about earlier. What still needs to come online with the, with, to make the new building fully operational as, as camps? As, Camps for all your fall sports get started. Right, right now, I would say it's almost punch list items. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, some like getting the electronics all, mm -hmm. but physically the construction piece uh, is yeah. is fully finished. Uh, are you guys? Good to, I don't remember the exact timeline on the, the training table on the second second level stuff. Is that is that the, stuff the training table it? will open uh, next week? Okay. Uh, when whenever all the athletes come, we'll start. Uh, they've been preparing some meals and going, mm -hmm. trying to get it operational and up to speed. Obviously, we brought Flick in, which is a new company, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of new there. But when the athletes come in and start reporting next week, and not just football, but, but volleyball will come in, cross country will come in soon, mm -hmm. uh, soccer, um, they'll all be in the new training table from day one. 
I appreciate it. You bet. Thanks. Yep. Yep.